You are listening to the Hemp Startup Journey. My name is Jason De Los Santos, co-founder of Spectrum Labs, a hemp extraction facility in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm sitting down with hemp entrepreneurs, scientists, and politicians willing to share their perspectives, lessons learned, and how we can make an impact on the hemp and cannabis industry for everyone. Mike Michalowicz, thank you so much for joining me on the Hemp Startup Journey. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's get right into it. So um, people have already heard the intro. And um, I guess something I just thought about is, um, have you yourself been involved with hemp or cannabis? Like I know you have different companies and different people that you consult with. Uh, have you been involved with the industry? Yeah, so uh, so I did I did inhale, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, no no I haven't been directly involved in the industry. Sure. But as a consumer, my wife actually swears by it. She uh, she has inflammation issues, and there's there's unequivocally ex- uh, not data but experience that she has mm-hmm. that it, it helps with that. So she takes it daily. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you can say those kinds of things. I can't say that because the FDA will swoop down with their SWAT team. And oh, say, yeah. I, I know that. Exactly. I don't know, uh, you know, if it's scientifically proven yet, sure. but, but practically, yeah. So I, I'm a proponent. Yeah. Um, so uh, you have a lot of stories. One of the things that I love about your books is that you um, simplify concepts and you share a lot of stories. Can you share a story about someone who uh, started in the grind and figured out a way to differentiate their business and how that ended up for that person? Absolutely. And uh, I'll tell you the, the, the challenge that many people focus on is they believe they need to do best practice or, or replicate the industry, which then makes them trapped in being the same as the industry. So I'll give you a perspective with accountants. I've been working with many accountants recently, but I'll tell you, professional services, uh, selling hemp, making pizza, the essence of our business, the DNA of business is basically identical. We feel we're so unique, but the essence of how we operate the business is the same across all industries. So this accountant, um, what she did was she started her practice. Uh, I won't share her exact name just just because I don't know if that's appropriate, but uh, I remember her first year she did, I think, $40,000 in revenue, which meant she was taking home $20,000. Um, I have had multiple calls with her and she's like, I, I don't know what to do. I need to make more money. And I'm working, I'm, I'm doing everything I can. The, the problem is if you do everything for the business, you actually become the linchpin, you prevent the business's growth. So we had to start going through is delegating, removing work from her. But the other thing is we had to break the label. She put herself out there as an accountant. And I don't know, Jason, how you feel, but when you hear an accountant, a picture comes to my mind, that, that weird visor thing, like I don't even know why I have that, <laughs> the, the pencil in the mouth and, right. the, and the calculator. But the challenge of that image is when we see an image, we think that that image is the same for all accountants. So when she put herself out and say, I'm an accountant, my mind and her prospects would say, oh, I know what an accountant does. And uh, therefore, I'll work with you if you're cheaper. It forces downward price pressure. When people believe we're the same as everyone else, they're going to go for the cheapest. What we did was we changed her label to a profit advisor. And what that does is when someone comes to her and says, what do you do? She goes, I'm a profit advisor. It jogs their mind. They can't form a picture, a generic image of this. And they say, well, what is it? She says, well, I have the skills and a tool set to drive permanent profitability in your business. And by the way, I'm a certified accountant. That is included, but anyone can do that. She actually acknowledges acknowledge the image that all accountants are the same with the client. So she said, yeah, yeah, I do that too, but everyone does a good job. What makes me unique is I'm a profit advisor. She changed the label and that's when business started flocking to her. Now she was able to dictate a premium price. By dictating its premium price, she was actually able to hire virtual help, contractors, part-time, it started expanding. Today, fast forward, that business surpassed a million dollars. I got actually a call from her. Um, this is at the end of 2020 saying, oh my gosh, I cannot believe this. Within four years, she went from a $40,000 minus business to, to over a million dollars in revenue. And uh, she's absolutely thrilled. That transition was she broke the label and then she introduced systems and organization to her company. That's amazing. Um, one of the, the recent examples that I've seen about differentiation, you, you'll probably get a kick out of this, is a bank, which right now there are a gazillion banks in the oh, US. Yeah. There's, uh, you can look this up, Redneck Bank. 
Redneck. Uh, redneck neck. <laughs> Love it, right? Um, and it, they're they're not doing small potatoes. They're apparently uh, making about five hundred million dollars in revenue per yeah. year. And when you look at the website, it's all about like farm life. They have these animal characters on the Smart. website. Um, it, it's uh, a little bit raunchy, like you know, uh, but it's completely FDIC legitimate bank. But yeah. they're they're very specific about who they're targeting, like completely left field from like I don't know Bank of America or you know one of these like um, banks for anybody. Yeah, you know if you try to speak to everybody, you speak to nobody. There's a certain community that says finally a bank that gets me. Yeah. Now there's another community that's repulsed by it, says who are these idiots? I'm not going to deal with it. And that's actually the position we want to be in. Mm. But it is scary as a business owner to be to be scary to some people, to, to re repel certain people. But the only way to attract people is to speak their language. And we look at the Bank of America, these massive ones and say, but look, they're generic. They're only generic because they've gotten to that size. The, the small business advantage is to differentiate, to stand out, to speak very clearly and loudly to one community. Mm -hmm. Let them carry on your shoulders. Maybe Redneck Bank will get to a certain point where they can't be Redneck Bank anymore and they're Red River Bank or, or something. They got to make a change. Mm -hmm. But for now, they're going to win over, I strongly suspect, many clients because they're speaking loudly and and perhaps truthfully to who they are. Yeah. Um, and it seems like sometimes it's challenging to, to go and step outside of the, the norm because yeah. uh, as entrepreneurs, a lot of times we associate our ego with our company. Like it's hard when somebody says like, oh, no, like we don't want to we, we don't like that. And that, that it directly means that they don't like me as the business owner. Right? Oh, to totally. Right. And we have to disassociate ourselves. Uh, we are not the business. The business is not us. Yet it feels very much that way. Right. We're separate. So when someone doesn't like my business, it doesn't. They're not rendering opinion on me specifically, but if I take it that way, I'll actually start to modify my business because my ego's hurt. Mm -hmm. I get people regularly, because I like to goof around and stuff. They're like, Yo, you're such a goofy author. But what they're speaking to is not me, the person. They're speaking to me, the author. Mm -hmm. it, it's really another uh, identity that I carry, and they don't like it. But I also get the communication saying, thank God there's someone that doesn't have to be so darn serious. I don't want another professor teaching me. So... I need to strip myself out and break from that. It's not easy mm -hmm. by any stretch of imagination. Yeah. But one thing I do that helps is I pay deference to people that are resonating with my message. I will engage with them, communicate. And people that say, you know, as an author, you stink. Um, I simply, I acknowledge that they feel that way, but I don't engage. Mm -hmm. And therefore I keep on perpetuating what I believe is my difference and what I need to put out there. Gotcha. Okay. So um, I understand differentiation and I think a lot of people will. Uh, the point that that I have trouble with sometimes is going from like seeing these examples and realizing, yeah, that, that makes sense that they've separated themselves and there's, there's an yeah. attraction to their business. But then how do you go from my business is just the same as everybody else to my business could potentially be different by yeah. X factor? How do you, how do you get there? Small steps. And uh, I think when people hear this concept of getting different, that they, uh, think it needs to be outrageous, something extreme. And therefore, it feels very, really risky and we don't do it. It's small steps. In fact, if you're watching the video, uh, you can see behind me this bookcase I have is a different bookcase. This came out of little experiments I ran. I noticed that the vast majority of authors, um, experts and influencers, like yourself too, has a display of books. And I'm so grateful you're displaying my books. I am honored. But we have a standard bookcase. Well, when something is standardized for the consumer, the person witnessing or experiencing that, it becomes habitualized, meaning, oh, I've seen that before. And when something becomes habitualized, we've seen it before, we disregard it. Ah, that's, that's not relevant to me. So if I simply had another bookcase up here, people wouldn't examine. Mm. But the fact I put up something a little bit different, it's a tree that has books, it becomes compelling. It's like, what? I didn't expect this. What is it? We investigate something that's different. And uh, the beautiful thing, because we're doing this over Zoom, I've been presenting virtually, thanks to COVID, but I've been pre uh, presenting virtually. And what happens on Zoom is there's a dialogue going in the chat session with these folks that are your virtual audience, where before that didn't happen. People would see you speak and they'd be sitting there maybe taking notes or falling asleep. But now I can see what their real thoughts are because they type in the chat. Well, I see in the chat, people are like, what is this thing this guy's got behind him? Oh, that's cool. I wish I had a bookcase that looks like that. Or other people are like, that's stupid and distracting. But no matter what, they're engaging. And uh, I've actually seen people in the chat say, oh, check out. He's got more than just one book. Profit mm -hmm. First, my most popular. He's like, oh, he's got this fix this next book. I just checked out on Amazon. I'm picking it up. 
So being different garners attention. And I just want to encourage people do small steps. I just changed the bookcase and that's significant. It, the most significant thing is, is it's built my courage to be different again and again. Small steps in different build your courage to be even more different. Okay. Um, so you, you started several businesses um, and I think you have a company that, um, that sort of invests in your own uh, like ideas, I guess. Um, when you're looking into the market and saying, okay, well, we want to put out, I don't know, like a, a microphone because we think that there's an opportunity there. How do you think about or, or where do you go to try to figure out how can I make this product stand out? Yeah, yeah. So we try to sell ideas. I, and I think this is probably the greatest tip. Whenever uh, you, I come up with a new idea, what my suggestion is, is to go to my existing, uh, in my case, my readership, but, but my customer base. Specifically, I don't go to people that know me well. I don't go to friends or colleagues. And I say, hey, I'm thinking of creating this new microphone that I think will bring more clarity. It's lighter. It's more convenient. Whatever it is, here's the elements. I'm considering creating this. Are you willing to put down a deposit? So I've been saying that people do not speak the truth through their words. I don't know, Jason, have you ever gotten to some friends like, oh, I have an idea. I'm going to start a new business that does you know, CBD. Yeah. And, and they're like, that's so great, man. I would be there every day. I'll buy from you all the time. And we get this unbridled enthusiasm. But our friends know the rules. The rule is you support your friend. Mm -hmm. So you, you encourage them. But it's not authentic market feedback. So then you open the, the shop and no one comes to your business. You're like, what's going on? Because your friends lied to you. We lie through our words. Only thing that speaks the truth is wallets. And the best wallets to open is the stranger's wallets. If I can get someone that has no clue who I am to say, here's some money, I like that. They're proving through their action that they value my idea. So I always put the idea out there and say, well, are you willing to put down a deposit? If no one puts down a deposit, I say, thank you, bad idea. Not formed enough yet. Let me work on it again. If people start opening their wallets to put down a deposit, then it's time to, to bring this product to market. It's kind of like my own little mini Kickstarter campaign I do with my own community. Very interesting. Okay, that's really cool. I can see a lot of different ways that you can put this out there. Um, I, I've thought something similar about having, say, some of your customers and asking them if they want to be part of like a, I don't know what you would call it, like the, the tester group, like, you know, beta tester group. Yeah, beta, that's exactly what I call them as beta testers. Okay. Um, I stole that from your mind. Uh, no, you did not. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. uh, and, uh, you know, just every once in a while communicating with them, hey, here's an idea, you know, would you pay, I don't know, 10 bucks to, you know, pre-order this or something like that, uh, just to see if that's something that they, like you're saying, they would actually pull their wallet out for, as opposed to saying, oh, sure, like, that sounds cool. I'll definitely buy it. But when people say that, they probably won't. Exactly. And, and I also uh, inoculate people. And what I mean by this is if someone's willing to put down the 10 bucks or whatever the number is, and I encourage uh, uh, people that try this to ask the maximum dollar value you perceive, because you know, say I'm going to sell something for a thousand dollars, but I'm like, Hey, we just try it for $10. There's such a discongruence between the pricing that um, $10 is no risk for people. They may spend on it because they're getting such a gain, but it may not be viable at the higher price point. So I try to bring the actual price point in as quickly as possible. Mm. because I want to make sure we can sell at that point. Right. I also inoculate them. And what I mean by inoculate is I tell them this is a beta that there will be bumps and bruises. It's not going to be a perfect delivery. But if you're willing to take the risk of being an early adopter, I will cater to your specific needs. I'll modify my product or service as I learn from you. And here's the best part. Because you're modifying, enhancing, you're learning dynamically as you're selling. That's great. The customer is likely to be actually be serviced better than they would in just a standard transaction because you're engaging and learning from them. So they're actually, in many cases, thrilled with the experience. And at the end, now when I go to market, I have those beta users how you know 10 or 15 people who are built in testimonials there's no better way to go to market than saying here's 10 folks that have already done this and they send your video saying i was blown away this is mm -hmm. amazing there's nothing more valuable than having past customers when you go to new customers wow okay that's a that's a brilliant idea uh, okay uh switching gears a little bit uh in your most recent book uh, fix this next, uh, which I thought was awesome. I only read 10 pages because, you know, like you, you put it in a, in a special way that you said, read up until the point yeah, read what you, you can need. just go That's... somewhere else. Yeah. Um, read what you need. And uh, so uh, for one of our companies, sales is the thing. Like that's what yeah. we need to continue focusing on. Um, what would you recommend, whether one of your books or resources, to, if this company needs sales, which system or where do you go to focus on? Yeah. To so sales, so just to give a little context, there's five levels of needs identified in businesses. It's the common DNA ultimately. 
sales of the base, profitability, and it goes up. But within each level, there is what's called core needs. So in sales, you know, specifically, do you have a prospecting issue? I'm not getting enough prospects in the door, or maybe you have enough prospects, but they're not converting well, or, or maybe it's another element. So what we do is we drill down to a specific need, a resource for conversion. So traditional sales is all about converting. I have people that are coming to me, not converting. I haven't written a book on it, but I will tell you that the work by Zig Ziglar, uh, he's had, sadly he's passed away quite a while ago now, but his work lives on and it's really impactful on how to engage with the customer. My thought about this, and I actually, I am going to write a book about selling in the future. My ultimate thought is this, is that we need to be of simply of service. If you simply go in the mindset saying, how can I service this customer the best, um, regardless if it's involving our company or not, but what actually services them the best, you are actually likely to sell the most because people know that you're not trying to persuade, you're simply trying to be of service. There's a great example of this. There was a movie called Miracle on 34th Street. Have you ever seen that, Jason? Yeah, a long time ago. Yeah, classic movie, you know, classic uh, definition of Santa is this guy with the white beard and so forth. But in this case, he's the real Santa. And he's and he gets hired to work at Macy's as one of the Santas that's trying to uh, get pictures with children. And the children would come up and say, hey, Santa, I want to get a skateboard or whatever the item is. The parent would say, you know, to the Santa, I don't even know where to get one. And, you know, Christmas is two days from now. And the Santa would say, oh, go to Gimbel's. Now, they were working at Macy's. And this is when gimbals existed. They're across the street. They have the skateboards and they're less expensive. You see at the end of that scene, you see like the store manager make this you know, twisted, contorted face going, what are you doing? Santa, you're sending clients away. But he wasn't. He was being of service as clients. Mm -hmm. You see the next day, the place is flooded. And all the parents are like, this Santa gets you the best deal. This Santa cares about you. And Macy's was thrilled because now they were packed. That is, it's a fable, but it's a great example of what we can do in our business. You will build a reputation for excellence if you serve your clients excellently, which may even at times include not doing business with you, but they will never forget that. So I call it serve selling and Zig Ziglar has a lot of content around that, but that's where I get started. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Great, great tip. Um, switching gears again. Um, the, a lot of the entrepreneurs that we work with uh, for our clients, they have existing companies yeah. and they have a lot of stuff going on. And I would imagine that this is certainly the case for you where you have an audience, like you probably have a lot of folks coming to you and saying like, Mike, I got this great opportunity for you. Yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. $10 billion in three yeah, days. They all want my money. Everyone's like, hey, can you give me some money? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so how do you, um, like, what do you draw the line between uh, working on the things that you tell yourself that you're going to focus on and work on versus the potential opportunities that are out there, right? Like there's this yeah, constant so, influx. Yeah, yeah. So I definitely pursue a linear path. I, I know the next thing I've defined for myself, the next thing I want to do through business. If something presents itself that's in full alignment with it, I will consider it. But when someone emails me and says, hey, I have a new uh, glove that acts like a mouse, I'm looking for investors, I'd love your input. I'm like, I wish you great success. Totally not for me. I need to be super selfish. And I think that's true for all of us. We've got to be super selfish about how we want to be of service. In fact, I have it on my wall. That's my life's mission is to eradicate entrepreneurial poverty. It's the essence of it is to be of service to small business. Any request that comes in that's not even a, of service to small business, it's selling to consumers or whatever. Those are wonderful businesses. It's just not wonderful alignment with me. Yeah. The other thing too is I've, over time, I've built a company now. We have we have a couple locations, but between our two locations is about 15 to 20 employees. Um, and we have a leaders in this organization who are a different personality than me. I love to be a spokesperson and get all jacked up and we can do this, you know, cheerleader. But my, my teams here, there's, there's uh, a couple of folks in the leadership position who are much more reserved, pragmatic, focused. And that becomes a compliment. Because if it was just me by, me by myself, I'm like, that is a great idea. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. And I would start diluting myself. Yeah. My team here helps me stay extremely focused and just do one thing really well at a time. Okay. Uh, and, and on that point, uh, we were just talking before the, the recording that um, there's a boot camp coming up. I don't know if we'll release this before then, but uh, that talks about delegating. And instead of you I doing, love that you're doing everything, that. Um, you know, figuring out how you should delegate the things. One of the things that you said I was reading last night, it, maybe you can you can explain this to me. In um, what book was it? Uh, I think um, Pumpkin Plan. You said 
work yourself out of the business. Like totally. you know, figure out how you cannot work in the business and making sure that your team who can yeah. do those, fill those roles the best that they can do that. Like, can you clarify that? Cause like, to me, that's like, oh, well, I'm not going to do anything. Like I'm, I'm going to be out of work. <laughs> right. Right. And I, I've worked myself out of the business, but there's great privilege to that too, because you can then put yourself in, in a way that gives you this total joy. You can become a contributor in the way you want. So when a business starts out, it, it's usually just me or us, right? It's just one person, me, a partner. You have to do everything. But that very quickly becomes a trap because if you're doing everything, you are limited by your ability to do everything. So we need to start bringing in people. Um, but what happens for many entrepreneurs is to say, well, I do this so well, anyone I bring in, they can't, they can't do it to my level. They, they suck. And the reality is they don't suck. There's not a proper system in place or it's not being monitored. The dashboard isn't set up. There's a reason they're failing to achieve your expectations. And it is almost never their fault. Uh, it's something with the system or the management of the system. So then we start scaling things out. And delegation is the assignment, not of tasks. It's the assignment of outcomes. Here's what we're looking to achieve. And it's giving the person the freedom to navigate to that achievement, if even or particularly, especially not following the established protocol that you've defined, finding better and improved ways. At a certain point, um, you remove yourself from all the tasks. And how I did it was I started taking four-week vacations, four consecutive weeks. I've been doing it now. This is, I'm going to my fifth year of doing this. And when, when you remove yourself from a business for that extended period of a time, for most businesses, if a business can sustain without you and grow without you for four weeks, likely you can do it into perpetuity. And so that's why I intentionally take this. It, the vacation isn't for me. The vacation is for my business. The business gets a vacation from me, <laughs> you know? All right. Um, but here was the, this was the moment I didn't expect is I came in one day and I didn't need to do anything. Mm -hmm. uh, and that gave me the ultimate choice. I, I decided, and I talked to our team here, I, I want to do two things for the company. I want to write books because I love to write books and I want to be a spokesperson. Like what we're doing now, I love it. Just give me those two things. And they're like, absolutely do those roles. So I, I've reinserted myself. But if, if, if I head out or I leave, the business doesn't come to a grinding halt. It continues to sustain, hopefully even grow in my absence. Okay. All right. I, I, I have a lot to process there, but let's, let's finish up because you got to go here in a couple of yeah, minutes. Yeah, I got bold. Um, but uh, let's see, do you have any, um, uh, you have a new book coming out and we'll put that in the show notes. Do you want to mention a little bit about that? I, a preview? I'm honored. Thanks, Jason. Yeah. And the title actually just changed. Originally it was going to be called Different is Better, but we, we changed the title for a, a multitude of reasons. The new book is called Get Different. Hmm. And, and the goal here is this, is that as we started off the interview and the discussion here, is that most business owners serve the, the best practices of an industry. They actually comply with industry norms and therefore become invisible. The most impactful way to get noticed is by getting different, to do something unexpected, something that will jog the prospect's mind to say, what, what is that? And inquire. And if you can get a prospect saying, what is that? You've won the first significant step of gaining new prospects. You've got their attention. Mm -hmm. All right. Perfect. Um, all right. So last question before you head off, uh, do you have any challenge or any final thoughts for folks you know, based on the conversation that we had? Yeah. Well, let, let's stick with the, the different mentality. You know, I, I would look, I would challenge everyone in the audience to look at the industry and what is the common approach to, we'll say marketing in this case, in your industry. Do people put a big road sign out? Do they um, do mailers? Is it an email campaign? Whatever it is, challenge you to do something different. Now, there's two ways to do it. You can change the medium, meaning if everyone's doing emails, you can do a postcard mailer, or you can change the method. That's probably the better choice. If everyone's sending out an email with the same coupon, 10% off, um, what can we do that's totally unexpected? Maybe uh, it's a video of you demonstrating the products. Uh, maybe it's not 10% off. It's a, it's a coupon to pay 10% more. And it says, you're going to love our products so much that you're going to actually want to pay us more than we charge. Render this coupon and we'll charge you more. It gets so unexpected right. that it'll jog people's attention. They'll say, what is this? And you've won their attention. Perfect. Okay. Fantastic. So we'll put show uh, or links in the show notes about how to get a hold of you. Uh, you've been uh, extremely amazing and that you've created some resources for the audience. So we'll put that in the, in the links. And so I would definitely encourage everybody to go there, sign up. You have a lot of amazing things to offer and uh, you're doing great work and you're certainly Thanks, uh, achieving your mission. So in, in your purpose. So thank you so much, Mike. Really Thank you, Jason. It. 
Hey guys, and before you go, this is Jason from Spectrum Labs. Please be sure to visit us on the web at thespectrumlabs.com for any show notes and links discussed in the podcast. Also, remember to click the subscribe button wherever you may be listening from so you get notified when our next episode comes out. And tune in next show and have a fantastic day. 